insisted that she didn't um, share my story of running into a bank that my son shared the very first night he ever met some of the teenagers here in youth. Um, I'm just so happy to be here and I'm so humbled and was so disappointed that I didn't get to come share with y'all last night. I was here Wednesday night. It was just such an awesome night. And um, it's just so amazing to see so many teens in one place um, for three nights in the middle of the summer, just praising God and worshiping together. And I most certainly wish that I would have been where y'all were at this age. So props to you guys for, for being here and for loving God the way that you do. So let's just start out with a prayer tonight. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to come here and for everything that you have given us, God. We thank you that we are able to gather here tonight for a revival to praise your name when there are so many Christians, God, right now who are being persecuted as we speak. Father, we come here tonight to hear your word and to fellowship together, and we pray that the Holy Spirit would fill the sanctuary and the hearts of everyone in it. I pray tonight, God, that you would remove me of myself and that I would speak the words that you would have me speak tonight. And that if someone here doesn't know you right now, God, that after tonight they would want to get to know you. In your name we pray. Amen. So I'm a, I love spoken word poetry. And I don't know if any of y'all know what that is. If you don't, look up Christian spoken word poetry on YouTube. It's really cool. So part of my message tonight, I just want to share a little bit of that with y'all. When you go to school or hang out with your friends, can anybody tell by your actions that you believe in God? Or can they not tell the difference between what you believe and how you act? Because you never do what you should be doing. And so when people finally figure out that you're a Christian, they start talking about you behind your back. And you wonder why when people look at you, they can't respect the fact that you say that you're a Christian. Because you may be the only example they have, and if they can't tell the difference between your walk and theirs, they're not going to follow God's path. Does anybody even know that you're a Christian? Do the people know that the God of you is there? When somebody who doesn't believe in God loses somebody that's close to them, do they even think to go to you for prayer because they don't know where else to go? And if not, then since when did Jesus become your own personal secret for no one else to know? I mean, are you serious? Jesus Christ didn't get stretched out on the cross so that your testimony could be mysterious because silent testimonies have never saved souls. Yet our testimonies lay low and we wonder why the world is the way that it is. Because a lot of Christians are too worried about other people's opinions and too busy trying to save themselves. You know, I don't know what's worse. Nobody knowing I'm a Christian or the only people knowing that I'm a Christian are the people in my church. But what you have to understand is people sacrifice their lives to spread the love of Jesus throughout the earth. And you mean to tell me you're more worried about what other people may think or believe? What if Jesus was more concerned about other people's opinions and the salvation you received? But they made him bleed until he bled, all his blood till he was dead, nails in feet and thorns in head. What if Jesus was less concerned about spreading the gospel and cared more about what other people instead? But nah. Instead, he stood for what's right, just so that everybody in the world could know and everybody in this church could night to know that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Does anybody know that you're a Christian by your actions, or does everybody think you're a Christian because you're acting? And the only reason I'm asking is because half of us are putting on a facade, trying to treat our walk with God like we're expecting full-time benefits, but he's our part-time job. But working for God isn't a part-time gig. It's not a job or a career. It's a lifestyle you have to live. Because what you, don't, what you have to understand is that one soul's trash is another soul's treasure. And if y'all won't take the time, then Jay-Z is going to continue to convince people that Jesus can't save them with an empire state of mind. Does anybody know that you're a Christian? Are you letting his light shine through? And if not, then how many times are you going to deny Jesus before Jesus denies you? My scripture tonight is two separate verses, three separate verses from John 
The first one, John 14, 6, the one that's been the theme for the week. Jesus told him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. And my other verses are John 3, 16, and 17. For God so loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent his son into the world not to judge the world but to save the world through him. The scripture that I read is very clear. They are verses that are probably some of the most memorized verses in the Bible. And they say that, let me read it again. I want you to soak it in. For God so loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son so that everyone, everyone who believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. It's very, very clear. The scripture does not say that God almost loved the world, that he almost sent his son. It says that God so loved the world so much that he gave his one, his one and only son. During my own personal reflections, I have often found myself asking myself these questions. Am I the Christian that I'm supposed to be all the time? Am I the type of person that was worth Jesus dying on the cross to save? Am I living my life in a way that is 100% satisfying to him? Do I fully know and understand that Jesus is the only way? Or am I almost a Christian? Almost is probably one of the biggest oxymorons of all time. You can't have almost stuff. You see, God didn't send his one and only son so that we might become almost Christian, so that we might almost live our lives for him. See, almost is no stranger to Satan, and here's proof he only tells lies when they're almost the truth. But on the contrary, Christ did his job fully, and he proved he was God when he died on the cross like it was his duty. And to pardon my iniquities that I have committed rudely, he proved that he was God when he resurrected from the grave, and he told death to excuse me. But excuse me, this is your life and something I don't want to impose on. But your body is God's home, and it was not meant to get foreclosed on. See, an almost Christian looks right but lives wrong. Can't stand the conviction of Romans. They always want to sit down and be comforted in psalms. Never understood worship, but they love to sing songs like, I surrender all most. Let me break it down because you need to be aware that your life could lack the very standards that need to be there. Because on that final judgment day, while God's receiving his heir, is he going to look at you and say, son or daughter, well done, or medium rare? And this is the very thing about God that we all try to get around. But you see, his standards are like between two mountains. There is no middle ground. There's no middle ground here. There are no options. There is no gray area. There is no fence riding allowed. There is no such thing as someone being almost Christian, or at least that's the way it's supposed to be. That's how it was for me until one day when I totally, absolutely, and completely surrendered, I took heed to a modern prophet who proclaimed it was time for change. Now I am no longer bound to sin, point blank, off the chain. You don't almost go to hell when you almost get saved. Jesus despised the cross where he was slain. And thus the cause for which he came. I want to explain tonight before I leave this stage that we have all worked for Christ in sin and death was minimum wage. But if it wasn't for Christ, we would have almost got paid. Far too often things become watered down. Scripture gets watered down. And by who? Who does those things? Almost Christians do. Jesus didn't almost die to save us from his sin, our sins. He did. He died so that we can live. He paid the price. He walked the walk and he talked the talk. So I would certainly think that if I'm going to parade myself around and say that I'm a Christian, my walk had better match my talk. 
I was in the middle of a Bible study once in my I Am Second group at church, and we were doing not a, fan and I, not a Fan, and it convicted me so much that I walked out to my car and I ripped the Jesus fish off the back of my car. You see, sometimes I have a little temper when I'm sitting in traffic, and that really got me thinking. And I didn't want somebody to look at that fish and say, oh, she's a Christian, and then see the way I acted, and it didn't match. I didn't want people to think that's what a Christian was being. So I didn't put it back until they matched, until I knew that I could represent what that Christian fish stood for, that I could represent what Jesus died on the cross for. But I find myself, as I'm sure some, some of you do in this room, sometimes I say one thing, and then when no one's looking, I think I can do something else. I mean, I volunteer time at my church. I speak when I'm asked. I've led the youth for years. I attend Bible studies. I'm a preacher. But there's so much more than that. In order to not find ourselves in the almost Christian category, then we must be doing what we are called to do all the time. Not just on Sundays and at special services like a revival or when you sit in Bible studies. And as always, when I find myself faced with these issues, when I find myself questioning who I am, God always sends me things at just the right time to help set myself straight. And as always, I find myself faced with these issues. You see, I'm the type of person, I read my Bible, but sometimes I don't understand it. Sometimes I find it hard to follow. I'm the type of person that God has to hit directly over the head with things. I learn things the hard way. And sometimes he'll hit me with scripture, and other times it might be a Christian song just when I needed it, or during my devotion time, or Wednesday night when somebody gave their life to God right here at this revival in this sanctuary. You see, even though I stand on the stage and I'm the pastor of three churches, that does not mean that I don't have my fair share of up and downs. I was once a teenager just like you, who found it really hard to live in this world. I attended Christian school from second grade through my senior year of high school. And at the beginning of my senior year, I got pregnant, and they kicked me out. You see, I thought I knew better. I thought I knew the way. So I didn't listen to the adults that were around me or the God that I knew that loved me, and I attempted to travel my own path. Everyone in life will have to travel their own path. And some paths are straight and narrow, and some are rocky and hard, and they will beat you down till you feel like you can't even get up. I took that ugly path, the one where everything I did I knew was wrong. It went against everything I'd been taught by my parents. My mom's a pastor, too. She's been my pastor my whole life. I was raised in a middle-class family. My mom's a pastor, and my, da my dad is nothing but a simple, hard-working, godly man. They raised me and my sisters the right way with the right morals, but I allowed myself to convince myself that I knew what was best for my life. So off into the world I went, a teenage girl pregnant thinking that I knew everything, and boy, did I find myself in some really dark places. I found myself surrounded by drugs and alcohol. I found myself sleeping on the steps of a church in North Charleston. And I'm not talking about the pretty parts of North Charleston that they're reviving over there. I'm talking about the bad parts. I found myself alone and miserable. I married the man who was the father of my child against my parents' wishes, and we had a second son. And then we continued a life that was not the way that God wanted us to live. My marriage was awful, and I was abused mentally and physically. I was beaten down emotionally, and yet, even through all of that, I still could not heal, he, heed the words of those around me. Then he decided to leave me, and I found myself a single mother of two boys, two boys that are my whole entire world. Now, you would think at that point that with everything that I had been through, that surely by now I had learned that I needed God in my life. Surely at that point, I would have learned by now that Jesus was the only way, but I had not. I only thought that I was a Christian because I went forward during an altar call in middle school. But little did I know what that meant. 
So here I am, the mother of two and single, and I wanted to do what I wanted to do, so I continued down the wrong path. Then I met my now husband who told me when we were dating that if that's the lifestyle I wanted to live, then he wasn't going to be a part of it. Well, I loved him, so I, so I stopped the partying and stuff. A couple of years later, after we were married, I was attending the funeral of an amazing man. He was a member of my mom's church. I still was not attending church, but I wasn't necessarily doing the bad things anymore. I still thought I was living an okay life. I figured as long as I don't do bad things anymore, that that's what it was about. And I sat in the back of the sanctuary at this funeral because I didn't want people to see me because then they might start hassling me to come back to church. And I don't want to hear that. That was my conviction. That was God convicting me. So I sat in the back and I watched person after person. There must have been a hundred, I swear, that day that came forward to talk about what an amazing man he was, what a godly man he was. And that got me thinking. If I were to die tomorrow, what would they say to me at my, about me at my funeral? It made me stop and think. First off, when you run with the wrong crowd, they leave you when things get going rough. They don't even hang around. When you find yourself in those situations and the friends you thought you had, they, they go because they don't want to be part of it. So you're left all alone. So there wouldn't have even been that many people at my funeral to be with that, that would have attended. And then the things that they would have said are not things I would have want repeated. She partied hard. She could hang at the bar. She did all these things. That makes for a pretty good obituary, right? So it was at that very moment in 2007 that I really and truly gave my heart to Jesus. I begged for forgiveness from the things that I had done, and I invited them into my heart, and I made a commitment that I wasn't going to look back. I went home and told my husband that we were getting into church. He could either be with me or against me. Thank God he was with me. And from that moment on, I never looked back except to thank God for delivering me from the path that I was no longer on. I know the struggles you're going through. I know the things that you're faced with on a daily basis. I've been there, done that, and got the t-shirt to prove it. And so have a lot of the other adults in this room that care for you and love you so much. I know it's hard. I know your parents don't understand you. My kids tell me that all the time. Ma, you don't get it. You don't. No, I do get it. You see, certain things about history, they always repeat themselves. And it's a different time, and I didn't have a cell phone back then. We, we rocked beepers, right? Pagers, mm-hmm. See-through ones, I was cool, okay? But other than that, the struggles are still the same. They're still the same. Sin still exists in this world. I know it's hard. I know that you don't necessarily understand everything that there is to know about God and Jesus. And I stand here on this stage as a pastor and say, me either. But I'd rather take the chance and do what I'm supposed to do and believe in a God that died for me than to not. What do you have to lose? But if there's anything that I want you to know for sure, without a shadow of a doubt, after this youth revival, when we all leave this place, and that is that Jesus is the only way. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He doesn't care where you come from, how much money you have or don't have, or how many friends you have. He doesn't care how many followers on Instagram. He doesn't care what color you are or what sins you've committed in the past. All he cares about is you and your heart and your soul and where you're going to spend eternity. And right now, if you don't know him, if you don't know that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and the way, we want you to know that. That's what these past three days at this revival have been about. It's what Pastor Dennis and Pastor Colby have preached about. It's what the songs you've been singing about, one way. 
It's what the Bible's all about, and it's what Jesus is all about. If there's any advice that I can give you that I know for a fact will change your life and the way you live, it's that if you don't know Christ right now, you need to get to know him before it's too late. Because we all think, oh, tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. And then tragedy will hit somebody. And yeah, you'll look at it. And you'll think, okay. I lost friends when I was y'all's age. To suicide, to overdose. A kid that I know that was 22 years old died tragically on a motorcycle accident a year ago. I'd really love to be able to look at you right now and say he went to heaven, but I'm pretty sure he didn't. And that makes me so sad. It makes me so sad. You have to invite him into your heart. And when you do, it will be the best thing you've ever done in your whole entire life. Because all of a sudden, all of the things that you have felt were a void in your life, they just magically, it changes you. It's by far the coolest thing I've ever done in this life. And I used to sit back and I used to say, I don't got to go to church. I can worship Jesus from home. You can. You can. But you miss out on this fellowship that goes on like it was tonight. And it is tonight and for the past two nights. And for people to help hold you accountable. I, I didn't participate in my youth group like some of you do with your groups. And you're making memories and developing friendships that you will have for the rest of your life. Friends that will help hold you up. That's what y'all got to do for each other. Because there is no one else on earth, let me tell you, other than Jesus, not your parents, your grandparents, your brothers, your sisters, your friends, there's no one that's going to love you the way that he does and be there for you the way that he will be. He's the only one that's never going to talk about you and he's never going to leave you stranded. He's not going to cheat on you because he wants to be with someone else either. He knows your self-worth. He just wants to be in your life and in your heart, and he wants to have an re- intimate and intentional relationship with him. And intimate and intentional are big words right there. You can't just invite him into your heart and not do anything else. Your whole life has to change. The way you walk, the way you talk, the friends that you hang out with has to change. Because if it doesn't, it's all done in vain. It just is. And you have to remember, it just can't be almost. It's really hard to be a Christian at school. In public school, public school do do things that they try to shut religion down and things like that. But I'm telling you, and I know y'all probably heard this before, as long as there is a test in school, there will always be prayer. Because I was always praying right before the test. Okay? They can't take that away from you guys, kids. They may not allow you to stand up and publicly pray, but you can sit there and pray yourself. You can live your life the way that you're supposed to, according to God. So that others around you, they want to know what you're on. It's a Jesus high, y'all. I'm telling you, I'm on it all the time. People think I'm crazy sometimes. What are you drinking, Jesus juice? That's a thing. I'm telling you, it's a thing. Jesus juice. You can't almost give your life for him. He didn't almost give his life for you. And it's going to be hard. It's going to be hard. He does not say that it's going to be easy. He just says it's going to be worth it. It's going to be uncomfortable. But I assure you that when he was nailed to the cross, it was not comfortable for him. It was not. I get it. I know it's hard. I know that you struggle. I know the things you struggle with. And don't think that you're the only one. Just because an adult in this room maybe has never shared a personal story with you about something they've been through doesn't mean they haven't. Just go to them and say, hey, can we talk? Can we talk?
the best thing I've ever done in my whole entire life was to give my life to God. And now my feet are planted firmly at the base of the cross. And I dare people to challenge me on that. You get ugly looks being a Christian. People look at you funny. Jesus freak. I, I love that. I love it when somebody calls me a Jesus freak. Thank you. Yes, I am. I'm going to go to heaven. Where are you going? I know where I'm going to be. How about you? That's the only gamble I'm telling you to ever make in your whole entire life. Gamble on Jesus. You'll win every single time. I swear it to you. Jesus is the answer, the truth, the life, and the way. And I know that we're going to split up into some small groups where you're going to have some opportunities to talk and then we'll come back at the end of the night. And I know that none of y'all know me. It's, it's kind of funny. I babysat Gracie when she was a baby. My mom married her parents. And when I found out that I was moving out to Macedonia, I'm the pastor of Hood's Chapel right here on 17. And then I have two churches that are way in the forest that way. And... Um, I, I messaged her on Facebook and said, hey, I'm coming out your way. I'm really excited. I want to get to know people in the community. So I, I, I pray that God allows me for this not to be the last opportunity that I get to see y'all. And I've only met some of these other adults tonight, but I, I know April and I know her heart and I know where she stands for God and I know how down to earth is and I've heard her testimony too. She gave it at my mom's church one time and I'll never forget it. But these for sure are adults that you can turn to. If you don't know them, please, 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 tonight, talk to somebody, okay? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you, thank you, thank you. Just thank you so much for the opportunity to be here tonight, for the youth groups that are represented and the adults that are here and for sending your son to die on the cross for us, God, because we didn't deserve that. And you, 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 he did it anyway. Thank you for another day of life that you've given us that we didn't deserve either, God. And for everything that you've given us, we have roofs over our head and we have food in our stomachs, God. And we're just so thankful. And I just pray tonight, God, as we finish the the, the last night of the revival here, that if there are any kids in this room right now, God, that as they split up into their small groups, that they'll have some serious conversations, God. Just let the Holy Spirit flood those rooms. Let the Holy Spirit flood their hearts as they talk about these things. We love you, God, so much, but we know that you love us so much more. In your name we pray. Amen.